Join us to talk more about Converging Roads and other initiatives of the John Paul II Foundation is the organization's president and founder, Arlen Nichols. Arlen, great to have you here. I've attended several events organized by the JP2 Foundation, but it's great to be able to sit down and talk with you about the group's mission. Uh, Tell me a little bit about when the foundation was founded and what was the purpose? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, so we're actually celebrating our 10th anniversary this year uh, in just a few weeks. Uh, the 15th of May is our is our 10th anniversary. So it's, a, it's an exciting time for us as we look back at 10 wonderful years. Um, so our mission is, is dedicated to life and family. Uh, we educate medical professionals uh, through our Converging Roads Medical Ethics Conference, as well as do marriage enrichment through our Together in Holiness conference series and formation series. And then our third initiative is is for our clergy, providing continuing education and formation for deacons and priests and future deacons and priests. And so it's a privileged work to be able to do all across the country, really dedicating uh, our entire apostle to the salvation of souls and living the moral life through marriage and family life, through living out your vocation to the uh, presbyterate or diaconate well, and through your medical practice. This year we have 42 to 45 conferences nationwide. I mm. mean, <laughs> that's just crazy. It's an <laughs> awesome, incredible growth over 10 years. Um, but to be able to partner with dioceses all across the nation to serve families, medical professionals, and our clergy is a true pliv- privilege for us, and we're blessed to be able to do that work from Houston, uh, from the heart of Texas, all across the nation. And credit to your team there. I know you've got a good growing group there in in the Houston office, and they work really hard, and you guys try to be well-organized for everything. Uh, Why is fostering an environment where holy families can grow and thrive so needed in this day and age we live in? Well, I mean, you know, that could be a couple hours of conversation or a few days of conversation, right? But, I mean, at the end of the day, I always call back, and I'm sure you've used this many times, but as the family goes, right? I mean, John Paul II, right? As the family goes, so goes the nation, so goes the whole world in which we live. Um, the family is that seedbed, right, of vocations. It's that seedbed of fostering the faith. It's the place where the faith is lived and where it's learned. And John Paul said that scarcely anything can make up for the failure of parents to provide an education to their kids. And so mom and dad have a crucial role. Husband and wife have a crucial role, right? To live beautiful marriages, to pass on that faith, to teach their children how to pray, to teach the virtues, to open up our children, right? I'm a father of 10, to open up our children to that primordial vocation that every single one of us has which is that vocation to love. And so as the family goes, so goes the whole world. And so we've got to really invest in our marriages and in in our families, in our kids. And so through our Together in Holiness initiative, which we've now done, this year will be 10 years of doing it here in Houston, um, it, it really helps to meet that need to help families really become what they are. That was a great one of John Paul's great mm-hmm. phrases, like family, become what you are. All right, so what does that look like? What does it mean to be a Catholic family? What does it look like to do the Catholic thing in the home? And so uh, in, in... you know, theological, theologically sound and beautiful and doctrinally accurate ways, but in practical ways, we're helping to inspire families um, within communities of like-minded families to do that Catholic thing from the home, to do, to do what we're called to do, to become, as John Paul said, what we are. You had mentioned that you and your wife have 10 children, we so do, I, yeah. I, I can't let that go without talking more <laughs> about that. I know you mean it, Arlen, when you say that the family is so important to you, not only for your work, but also for yourself personally in your own life, your your own personal vocation. How do you do it? 10 kids, it seems like a lot. To well, deal how do I do it? I, I have an amazing saintly wife. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's a great thing. I chose well. Um, no, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I, I mean, I, I say that jokingly, but with all sincerity mm-hmm. as well. Uh, I, I have an incredible bride who, who um, you know, just does a wonderful job. But I think so much is about simply being intentional, you know, and, and not allowing our family to get caught up, right, in kind of the rat race. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just for business anymore, right? The rat race is children's lives as well. You know, you got to be in all the clubs and all the things, and, and all of a sudden you find yourself caught up in all the extracurriculars, right, that, that just maybe in some cases aren't essential, you know, and, and, and they become the most important thing for your family. 
And we don't want that. And so for us, the, the biggest thing, that I, I would say, the decision that we've made is to make sure that our faith, our church, our parish, um, the apostolate that has been entrusted to us remains number one, right? There's no balancing these things as if they're equals, right? I mean, there really isn't. It really is always our faith and, uh, and, and working for the salvation of souls within the home always has to be number one in every decision we make. So no, the real answer is my bride, but we, we try to be intentional, intelligent, so that we can ardently do the Catholic thing at home. Very good. You had mentioned that you have dozens of events that you plan throughout the year yeah. in different cities. How do you decide where you want to go, what cities, and what what you want to do? Sure, you know a lot of that is it comes to us. You know, we a diocese will reach out to us and say, "Hey, we heard you've been doing this, or we, you're working with our neighbor here, or maybe you're doing a, an initiative already in this in this city and 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 with this diocese, and so we want you to bring your next initiative." So for us, there's been a lot of organic growth, you know, over the years, which is healthy, right? Because it's it's success is breeding success, and 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 those who know us want more of what we what we provide. Um, so, you know, obviously you're, you're looking for places that, uh, where the initiatives can thrive, where there's openness to, to each of the three initiatives. But our approach is one, you know, we're not culture warriors, you know, at the St. John Paul II Foundation. We're not a political organization. We're about apostolate and we're about evangelization and the proclamation of the good news. And so that really allows us to open, uh, open the doors and partner with Diocese from all across the country, you know, and and from you know different with all kinds of different ordinaries and priests, um, and to really serve the church as a whole because we're really focused, as I mentioned, you know, on on helping priests right to do their vocation well, to meet the needs of families and that we're facing in the culture, helping couples to to live out their marriages well, and those are so needed in our society today. So there's been a lot of organic growth, as I mentioned, as many as 45 conferences this year. Um, I mean, and just even year over year, last year we had 35, if I recall, 32 uh, last year. And so that kind of growth, you know, 10 years in uh, is, is just a real privilege and joy, and it shows that we're having a great impact um, within within the, each of the three initiatives. So, One of those events that's coming up is here in Houston on April the 20th. That's it's right. It's going to be at Cathedral High School, and it's called Converging Roads. For mm-hmm. people who are not familiar with Converging Roads, what is that specifically? Yeah, so Converging Roads is our healthcare ethics conference. It's a day-long intensive conference. Um, we'll have here in Houston. We'll have six presentations uh, by five different speakers, but it helps our doctors and our nurses, our chaplains, anybody involved in medicine, uh, to really bring their faith, to bring their ethics into the practice of medicine with that conviction, right? That that I'm actually a better doctor. I'm a better nurse when I don't check my faith at the door. When I bring my ethical convictions, right, informed by my faith into the care that I provide my patients. And so it's a, it's a day-long, wonderful conference. Continuing education is available for, uh, and continuing uh, medical education for nurses, for doctors, but also for social workers and chaplains is also available. Um, they have to earn it anyway. What if it was Catholic? What if it was faithful, right? Mm -hmm. What if it inspired you and helped you to bring your faith and your ethics into your incredible practice of medicine, the care you provide your patients? So that's what uh, Converging Roads is is for and what it's about. Um, And it really is just, it's a grueling day. It's a long day. Sure. Uh, But it's it's one of those days that you're, you're tired afterwards, but then inspired as well to do your medical practice just a little bit differently uh, for the sake of your patients. So. And it seems appropriate because we're here in Houston. We have the, the medical center and we have so many professionals in the wider medical field. It feels like you have that ability to draw from a lot of different places in the greater Houston area. Absolutely. I mean, and it serves the whole greater you know, Houston mm-hmm. area, as you mentioned. And, um, um, and one of the real highlights for me is we have so many medical schools and nursing schools here, like UST, for example, right, mm-hmm. is one of our nursing schools here in town. It's one of the, it's the Catholic one. Right. Um, and we'll get, you know, uh, a few dozen, I mean, la- the last few years, we typically have 40, 45 medical and nursing students on full scholarship, right, to come to the conference uh, through our uh, Dr. Mini Medical Scholarship Fund. And, uh, and so they're, they're able to visit, you know, with accomplished medical professionals and the experts who are coming to speak and, and learn how to to, to 
you know, at times balance the secular mm-hmm. pressures that they face within medicine, which are very, very strong, on, especially with regard to conscience rights, religious liberty, end of life issues, beginning of life issues, areas around sexuality. Uh, I mean, it's tough. For our medical students and to have 40 or so medical students, nursing students there and to really be able to to dig in and figure out how they can do what their future colleagues are already doing is awesome. It's it's such an exciting thing to see. And and it's a it's a very young conference. Typically, it's it's mm-hmm. which is surprising. It's not the typical thing in the medical field. Right. Typically, these conferences, it's a it's a very much older demographic. Here it's young, it's inspired, um, and and then there's a, then there's a good mix of those who have experience as well. So it's an exciting yeah. day, fun and, day, and I'm I'm sure it's probably rewarding to be able to hear back from them at the end of a conference, being like, "Well, there are all these important topics on ethics and morality that I may not have thought about before." Sure, uh, in terms of the medical field, but but can <clears throat> aptly apply. Yeah, absolutely, and you know what we are, we've always been real big as an organization of making sure that. Well, we're not spinning our wheels, you know, that the impact is what we want it to be. There's no reason for us to do what we're doing right. if it's not going to have the impact. And so, you know, we do surveys and, and, and get feedback from our, our, our doctors, our nurses, our medical students, nursing students who are there and really hear how it is impacting them. And, and the numbers are incredible. I mean, most years here in Houston, it's 100 percent of the people say this is going to or this is impacting my practice. And then the people who come back each year, the nursing students or medical students, who come back three, four, five years into their own practices mm-hmm. shows, right, that this is something that's impacting them, right, that they are, in fact, uh, bringing it to their, to their patients, to their fellow physicians and nurses. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it's, it's an awesome thing to be able to see that, that it, it really is having an impact and changing and influencing the way in which our medical professionals and those who are involved in medicine uh, practice uh, the art and science of medicine. Very good. So if people want to sign up for that, again, then go on to y'all's website. It's forlifeandfamily.org, I mm-hmm. believe. And you have all the information on converging roads. Again, Compassion and Dignity in Healthcare coming up on April the 20th at Cathedral High School. Also, more information, of course, on y'all's website about all the different initiatives sure. and events that are going on here in Houston and across the country. Arlen, I would be remiss if I didn't get your take on your organization's patron saint, sure. uh, St. John <laughs> Paul II. Uh, what was it about him that you think makes him unique to where we as Catholics are still talking and thinking about his life uh, decades after after his pontificate? Well, I mean, that's a great question. Another, t- again, another we, question we, that could we, be a whole interview could, about, right? A whole, a whole couple of days. Uh, I mean, just what a marvelous saint. You know, I think at the end of the day, I want to answer your question this way. Um, his holiness, you know, he, he was the best of men. Right. I mean, he was truly a saint. And, you, and we knew that. You know, I'm part of the John Paul II generation. When he died in 2005, you know, he was the only pope I, I had known. I was born in 1980. You know, so, and, and so I was blessed to be um, to only know him right, as pope for the first 25 years of my life. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll, I'll never forget you know, when we named the St. John Paul II Foundation after him. I was pursuing doctoral studies in Rome and would go to his tomb every day. Uh, he was at that point blessed, John Paul II. And I'd go to his tomb every day, but I remember the first time going there, um, and it's where it is now, just left of, of the Pieta at St. Peter's. And I went there the, for the first time. I walk in, and there's a line. It's one of the busiest areas in, in, in all of St. Peter's. And I just start weeping. You know, hey, I'm a Texas boy, you know, I'm not, <laughs> what the, you know, this is not okay. You know, I look around, everyone's weeping. And what was it? Like, it, you, it was his holiness, but there was this, to me, there was always this look in his eyes, like a glean in his eyes. Like, you knew that even as he was proclaiming a truth that perhaps was difficult to receive or hard to incorporate in our lives, you knew that he loved you, not just generically, love humanity, love man, right? But that you were loved by him. So to me, I think that's what it is. Caritas and Veritate. He was a holy man who lived love in truth. Um, and uh, just an incredible witness. I hope he continues to remain close, right, to the hearts and minds of, of, of men and women who aren't part of that John Paul II generation, who didn't get to have that experience of, as I did as a kid, of singing in the featured 
choir for the papal audience in my eighth grade year. Mm -hmm. You know, like not everyone got to have that experience uh, or go to a youth World Youth Day, but I hope he'll remain close to the hearts and minds of, of the lay faithful because he is an incredible patron for us as an organization, but also for each one of us. Well, we are also very blessed to live in a day and time where we actually can have his recordings of things that he said right. and did. So we have lots of pictures and lots of video too for even the younger generations to learn about him as well. So we're thankful that you took the time to come visit us, by the way, Arlen Nichols at AM 1430. We're glad to hear about the work that you do and the, and the work that your team does uh, right here out of, out of Houston, Texas. Arlen Nichols, president and founder of the St. John Paul II Foundation. Appreciate your being with us today. Thank you for having me. God bless.